Ladies and gentlemen, do you get the feeling that you do not have enough memory bandwidth, do you? Well, things are going to be changing pretty soon. There's a report going around that on August 29th, there's going to be Haswell E, X99, and DDR4 arriving. So, there's already been quite a few motherboard unveilings regarding X99. In fact, so many that I've not even bothered to cover it because it's just been consistent. But, we are hearing news that Intel's Haswell eCPUs are going to be nearing um, their release date. And I'll go into the specifications just just a moment. But a Japanese website, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing this correctly, Hermitage Akariba, um, I probably butchered that name terribly, but regardless, they're saying there's going to be three CPUs arriving. Um, I'll go into the specs as I said in just a moment, but the CPUs are going to be the i7-5820K. These are all Ks. The, I the i7-5930. And finally, the i7-5960. Once again, they are all Ks. And accompanying these, we're going to be seeing DDR4 memory. Uh, now that, however, is going to debut slightly later. That's going to be sometime in September. Now, I'd also like to point out, slightly off-topic, veering away, we're going to be seeing the new GPUs arriving soon-ish, too. What does all of this mean? Well, pain to your wallet, and happiness to frame rates. Um, I've got to say this a little sooner than what I originally anticipated. I wasn't... I was actually half expected some of the stuff to be delayed, if I'm totally honest. And yes, this is a rumour. But it's more specific, I suppose, than mid-September, so August 29th. So I'm going to quickly go over the specifications. It's going to be like super duper duper quick. Ready? The i7, the 5820, is going to have um, six cores. These are all obviously i7s, so well, rather obviously hyper-threading. So it's going to have uh, six cores, 12 threads, operating at 3.3 gigahertz, 15 megabytes of level 3 cache, which is a bit of an odd number, but there you have it. I guess it's just with the amount of cores and all. Uh, there's going to be 28 PCIe Express lanes. Um, it's going to have a TDP of around 140 watts, an expected price of around $400. Meanwhile, it's the same amount of cores for the 5930, um, but it's going to have a slightly higher clock speed. It's going to be running at 3.5. The biggest difference here is it's going to have 40 PCIe Express lanes, which, for those of you who are planning on say, high-end Crossfire rigs or high-end SLI rigs, that could definitely be a bonus, particularly as, obviously, PCIe bandwidth can be a bit of a problem if it's only running in, say, times 8 or whatever. Um, and then you've got the 5960. Now, this circuit is electrical, and it requires 1.29 gigawatts of energies. Actually, I just butchered that. It's 1.21 gigawatts, isn't it? 1.21. I'm almost... I'm 90% sure it's 1.21. Anyway, it's going to have 8 cores and 16 threads. So, to be honest, for most gamers, this is probably not going to be what you want. Um, it's Regardless, it's going to be operating slightly slower. It's going to be running at 3 gigahertz, But it does have more cache. It's got 20 megs. And once again, it has 40 lanes. Of, obviously, however, the cache... It kind of evens out, get, considering there are more cores. Um, however, it's going to cost at least a thousand US dollars, which is pretty expensive. Honestly, the best deal here seems to be the 5820. Um, obviously, we're going to have to wait and see what goes on, but the, the i7 5820 is probably going to be the better deal. However, whether it's going to be worth gamers specifically saying, hey, you know what, let's upgrade from, say, a decent, just throwing out there, say, an i5-4670, especially if it's you've got a K that's fairly overclocked, or even, let's say, you've got a, I don't know, um, oh, let's say, a 2500K, and yours is pretty overclocked. 
how much of a performance increase you're going to get, I don't know. You're probably going to get quite a bit in some areas, like if you've got like a really high SLI rig, high-end SLI rig, let's say, for example, you get like a couple of Maxwells when those suckers are released, and you're gaming with a very, very high resolution, particularly if you're going like try crossfire but on a single screen, uh, like 1080p, it remains to be seen, to be honest. Um, so, I, I don't know. For some people, especially if you're doing a freaking lot of video editing, it's going to be really exciting. DDR4, the only problem I've got, as always, jumping onto a platform. I was one of the original adopters of Sandy Bridge. Remember when like 2500Ks or 2600Ks were doing the rounds? And I basically pre-ordered my stuff. And I got the first wave of the Sandys. And don't get me wrong, the chips were amazing. Um... The 2500K was really an astounding chip, and I actually overclocked it pretty well, even on a pretty shitty air, um, air fan, to be honest. Unfortunately, I was that person whose SATA 3... Or was it SATA 2, actually? I can't remember now. It's been so bloody long, I can't remember what SATA version was on the, the sand is, to be totally honest. That's really crap, I know, but hey, it's been several years. Don't even own the platform any longer. Regardless, the point being the moral of the story, I was that person whose set of ports died, and I was left with just a couple at one point, which really sucked. Um, so I had to actually change uh, and get like a SATA control card from a third party, third party vendor, which wasn't ideal. The moral of the story basically would be that being an early adopter and Buying the very first ones can be a bit of a problem. And yes, I could have replaced the board, and it would have meant, however, at that point, I'd had to rip open my entire PC, and I'd have been without a motherboard for a while, and it would have been a bit of a mess. So I just basically rode the storm and bought, and bought a, uh, a third-party uh, SATA controller because it was just so much easier for me. So I'm not saying don't buy it. I'm not saying that it's going to suck. I'm just pointing out that if you've got like a really good system, as is, you might want to wait um, and just kind of see what goes on. Regardless, it's pretty damn impressive. Uh, DDR4 definitely is going to help alleviate memory bandwidth issues. And I think for those of us who are using the integrated graphics card in the future, particularly when we start to see rather large shrinks to, say, 14nm and we get much more powerful GPUs, IGPs, that's going to be pretty important. Because I think that's when uh, memory bandwidth is going to be so much more important. Because integrated GPUs right now, to be honest, they're memory bandwidth starved. Um, and even if you're going with like the best DDR3 memory you can possibly get, they've still got issues. And DDR3 memory is also pretty um, pretty hungry when it comes to energies. It can be a little bit of a problem. So I think the switch to DDR4, when it becomes mainstream, and that's the thing. It's not going to be mainstream for a while. I imagine it's going to be a bit of a price premium. That's just a theory. But when it does become more mainstream, obviously that's going to allow integrated uh, GPUs to do a little bit more performance and have a little bit more memory bandwidth available to them, rather than being so starved. As it is, memory bandwidth for DDR3 It's a little bit of a problem in some cases, um, especially if you've got the the lower end DDR3 with like bad latency, you can have some problems on uh, like a very high end CPU, and you're doing like a lot of processing. But generally, for most gamers, it's not going to make huge differences, I'd imagine. At least that's from the testing that I've seen. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care and bye for now.